Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our Google Earth Engine for Land Monitoring Application Series. Uh, my name is Zach Bankson, and I'm based out of the NASA Ames Research Center in California, along with my colleagues who are joining me for this training, Brittany Beaudry, Juan Torres Perez, and Amber McCollum. So before we get started with today's session, let's cover some logistical reminders. Uh, the series includes three two-hour sessions. The last remaining session after today will be held on the 30th at the same time of day. Uh, that's 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And after each live session, recordings of the series can be found on the training webpage. Uh, there's also one Google Form homework due on July 14th for this series, and I've provided uh, the link to the webpage here on the slide. As usual, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of each session, um, but if we're not able to get to your question or if you have any questions after the session is over, uh, please feel free to email us at the addresses we've provided here. So as I mentioned, this series includes three sessions uh, with each focusing on the use of Google Earth Engine for land monitoring applications. In session one, if you remember, we went over the basics of Google Earth Engine, uh, calculated a set of vegetation indices in the JavaScript API, and took a quick look at the available Python API. And after today's session in part three, we'll calculate a number of indices to assess environmental parameters over a time series and use this time series to detect land surface change. But for today, uh, we'll go over methods for completing a supervised land cover classification uh, to identify cover types like deciduous tree stands, uh, mixed forests, and uh, cultivated lands. So we'll also complete an accuracy assessment to evaluate the performance of our classification. Um, and I mentioned our names earlier, um, but just here's some pictures of the RSET Eco team uh, so you can put faces to names. I um, mean, we're also really lucky to have a guest speaker today, Brittany Beaudry uh, from the NASA Developed National Program and she'll be walking us through our code demonstration today. Okay, so here's a quick outline of what we'll be covering. First, I'll go through some slides where we'll cover land classifications using satellite imagery, uh, supervised classification methods, the basics of classification accuracy assessment, um, and how we can use Google Earth Engine to complete, to complete these types of analysis. Then we'll transition to the GE code editor and Brittany will walk us through uh, Landsat data retrieval, imagery prep, running a supervised land classification and basic accuracy assessment using the JavaScript API. And to finish things off, we'll have our Q&A session so we can answer any questions that you might have. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with our land classification and accuracy assessment overview. Um, these are two pretty extensive topics, uh, so we won't be completing an exhaustive overview today, um, and we'll focus mostly on what you need to know for this session, uh, but I'll go over a couple of past RSET trainings where you can learn more about these topics. Okay, so jumping right in, uh, many of you are likely already familiar with land classification in some way, uh, but just as a refresher, Land cover classification is the process of grouping spectral classes and assigning them informational class names. Um, and spectral classes are groups of pixels that are uniform with respect to their pixel values um, in several spectral bands. And informational classes are categories of interest uh, to users of the data. And that's things like water, forest, urban cover, agriculture, et cetera. And it's important to note that these informational classes uh, vary according to the needs of the user. Um, which basically just means that as the user, you're able to define what these classifications are, and since they're for your own use, you can determine those that um, you find most useful. So here's a land classification you might be familiar with. Uh, the USGS National Land Cover Database uses 30 meter pixel Landsat data to complete land classifications of the US. Um, and this can be a really great place to start if you're interested in looking at examples of land cover classes. So in image classification, uh, like those we complete using satellite imagery, uh, there are two methods. Uh, the first is pixel-based, and the second is object-based classification. In pixel-based classification, each individual pixel is grouped into a class, 
And this type of classification is particularly, particularly useful for landscapes that experience multiple changes in land cover within short periods of time, uh, since the classification is completed pixel by pixel. And it's also best for complete data coverage um, and ensuring the consistency of time series analysis at the pixel level. So in object-based classification, pixels with common spectral characteristics are grouped together during segmentation. And this method can be particularly useful for reducing speckle noise in radar images and high resolution imagery, but it often misses cover type variation at that pixel level. So given advantages like full data coverage and uh, pixel level sensitivity, we'll be focusing on pixel-based classification within this session. And this type of classification uses spectral information represented by the digital numbers in sensor data across spectral bands and attempts to classify each individual pixel based on recorded spectral signatures. And to clarify, digital numbers are the values recorded for each pixel in an image uh, that tell us the brightness of light reflected. And since this information is recorded using various bands, we're able to compile a spectral signature for any given pixel. And these spectral signatures uh, capture variation in reflectance at different wavelengths according to the objects on the ground. And in our case, we're interested in the reflectance of different land cover types. So for example, in the plot on the right, we can see that green vegetation absorbs red wavelengths of light, but reflects near infrared wavelengths giving vegetation a spectral signature that is distinct um, from other land cover types like soil, also plotted here. So this spectral variation is how we can distinguish land cover types from each other in remotely sensed imagery. And typically it's easier to distinguish between broad classes uh, like forest, agriculture, and bare soil. And it's often more difficult to distinguish within broad classes, like attempting to classify plant species within a broader vegetation class. So in the example here on the slide, we can see many spectral signatures plotted for pixels within the vegetation and soil classes. Uh, but when we plot these pixels together using bands three and four, we see that the reflectance values cluster pixels of the same type uh, very closely. So this is why you'll likely notice that many land classifications have broader assigned classes. Um, however, there are advances in hyperspectral and high resolution remote sensing, um, as well as machine learning that can assist in more specific classification of pixels. So two different methods are typically used to create land cover maps. In the unsupervised method, a classification algorithm assigns each pixel into clusters of similar pixels, and then the user must interpret this clustering and assign each of the pixel groupings a value corresponding to a land cover class. And the, the supervised method utilizes user-defined areas of known land cover types that are called training areas, and these areas are then used to define the statistical parameters of classification algorithms. So the algorithm then automatically identifies and labels all the pixels that are statistically similar to the training data. In the figure here on the slide, the unsupervised classification has clustered similar pixels, um, which must now be labeled with the class by the user, um, while the supervised classification has produced a map using an algorithm trained with reference data uh, to automatically assign pixels to a class. So the process is a bit different when we compare the unsupervised approach and the supervised approach. For unsupervised, we may know a little about the area. Um, we may know little about the area, so we allow the computer to group pixels without any reference data. And the classification algorithm runs on its own. And then we evaluate how the computer grouped the pixels and we assign each of the groups to a set of categories or classes. So then we evaluate the classes and make edits to those groups as needed. And then we run the algorithm and reevaluate the classification. But for the supervised method, we first have a set of ground or reference data that we assume to be representative of various classes within the study area. And these are our training sites uh, where we know what the land cover class is on the ground. And the algorithm then uses this information to group the pixels or objects into those same classes. 
And then we can evaluate the signatures, uh, classify the image, and run an accuracy assessment on the image itself. And for today's session, uh, we'll be focusing on the supervised classification method. So as we mentioned on the last slide, supervised classifications need training data as inputs for an algorithm to classify an image. And this requires an analyst to select training areas or points where the land cover class on the ground is known. And the simple example here notes the presence of known conifer, water, and deciduous areas. The spectral signatures from these predefined training sites are then used by the algorithm as reference points to classify the remaining pixels. And training data can come from a variety of sources, uh, like field collected ground data, citizen science land monitoring initiatives, um, or very high resolution imagery. Um, however, I would say that the gold standard of training data is typically considered to be ground observations uh, collected in the field. And I've mentioned algorithms quite a bit uh, during our discussion of supervised classification. I'm referring to machine learning algorithms uh, that use inputs like imagery and training data uh, to group and classify pixels. These algorithms are a black box, which means we're only able to examine inputs and outputs of the chosen machine learning algorithm. And essentially, uh, we provide the algorithm with training data to teach it how to group pixels into our chosen classes, um, but we're only able to observe its performance uh, by looking at its output classifications. So Google Earth Engine has a variety of available classifiers uh, ready for use in the JavaScript API. And these classifiers include the classification and regression trees or CART classifier, uh, the naive Bayes classifier, the support vector machine or SVM classifier, um, and the random forest classifier, just to name a few. So if you're already using machine learning algorithms uh, like these within your own work, you might find that running classifications like these in uh, GEE gives you more computing power and takes a little bit less time. So I've also shown an example of a deforestation classification in red here using um, example script from the SVM classifier uh, page that the GEE developers have created. Um, but for today, we'll be using the random forest algorithm for land classification. So the random forest algorithm learns from training data and identifies statistical patterns in large data sets to classify pixels for land cover assessment. And it's a tree-based machine learning algorithm, meaning it uses a series of decision trees to select the, the best classification for all pixels within imagery. It completes many decision, decision trees, which allow it to vote for the best solution. And typically, the more decision trees completed by the algorithm, the more accurate the classification. And you'll note that in many classifications, the number of decision trees completed by the algorithm is at least within the hundreds. And we'll go over how these decision trees work more in the next few slides. All right, so here we have an example of two random forest decision trees uh, attempting to classify a single pixel. So you'll note that the tree branches according to spectral characteristics that allow the decision tree to distinguish between pixels um, and ultimately classify them. So in the first tree, we start with all pixel types possible for this single classification, uh, then filter by a green value above 2000, and then filter, by, filter further uh, for a red value above 2000. This leaves us with a single class, thus classifying the pixel as urban in accordance with the characteristics of the training data. So in tree two, the classification is distinguished using the specifications of a red value above 1,000, and then by a red value greater than 1,000, but less than 4,000, yielding the classification of bare ground. So these trees run through a number of decisions and compile the classifications that result, assigning the classification as whichever class is most frequently predicted by the decision trees, and this is the, the voting um, that we discussed earlier, with each tree getting a vote as to what class the pixel falls under. And here we have a third tree 
um, which in this case acts as our tiebreaker between the urban and bare ground classifications. Uh, the tree asks if the pixel's blue value is above 2000, and then if the green value is above 2000. With two yes answers, the classification is determined as urban. So once the algorithm compiles the votes for each tree, um, it's determined that the best solution to the classification of this pixel is to classify it as urban, uh, since two thirds of the trees came to this conclusion. And remember, the random force algorithm is making these decisions and classifying pixels according to these specifications uh, because we provided it with reference data that trains it to group pixels in classes um, according to spectral information. So I just wanna quickly go over some of the advantages and limitations of random forest. In terms of advantages, uh, the use of multiple trees in random forest reduces the risk of overfitting, uh, which is when a model learns the detail and noise in the training data set uh, to the extent that it negatively impacts the performance of the model. Uh, the training time is shorter and not sensitive to outliers in training data. Um, it also runs efficiently and produces high accuracy for large data sets, um, which is particularly useful when classifying land cover of uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of pixels in imagery. Um, and it's easy to parameterize, um, as we'll see in our activity later. So these advantages are why we've selected uh, Random Forest as our classifier for the GEE activity. However, there are a couple of limitations to keep in mind. Uh, random forest cannot predict spectral range beyond the training data it's given. Um, this means that the training data must capture the entire spectral range of pixels uh, throughout the image you're trying to classify, or the algorithm will not be able to successfully classify all pixels within the image. Okay, so now that we have more background on the classification algorithm we'll be using, let's talk about accuracy assessment. So for land classifications, accuracy refers to the degree of correspondence between classification and reality. And accuracy assessment is the process by which the correctness of an image classification is evaluated. And this involves the comparison of classifications determined by the algorithm uh, to reference data that are assumed to be true. And this reference data is typically um, a subset of the training data withheld from the algorithm for comparison um, or additional ground truth data. So this screenshot here is just a quick preview of what accuracy outputs uh, uh, look like in the GEE console. And we'll talk more about how we assess accuracy of classifications in Google Earth Engine in the following slides. So as I mentioned during accuracy assessment, um, we're comparing algorithm generated classifications to reference data that reflects known land cover type. And agreement between reference data and the classifications uh, tells us that the classifier is performing well. And if there's no agreement, um, then the classifier has incorrectly measured the land class uh, resulting in errors. And you can see a simple table here, um, compiling agreement information between uh, the algorithms classification and the reference data. And to complete this comparison, um, we typically use a confusion or error matrix uh, for a number of pixels and reference points. So we'll go over a simple error matrix um, in table format to familiarize you with how this works. Uh, the table shows the comparison of reference classes that we assume to be correct. Uh, these are the columns and mapped classes that are the output of our chosen classification algorithm. And these are the rows. So the number of correctly classified pixels is shown along the diagonal um, in the middle of the table. Um, you'll see that we have 45 cases of agreement for the urban class, uh, 91 for agriculture and so on along that diagonal. So then if we look at the column totals, uh, these are the total number of reference pixels in each class, uh, shown here in gray and outlined in green. And these are the total number, number of pixels we know to be true for each of the classes, urban, agriculture, forest, and bare ground. So 
The row totals, on the other hand, are the classified pixels for each land cover class, uh, shown here in gray. So these are the total number of pixels our classification algorithm identified uh, from that particular class. And if you take a quick glance at the row totals and then the column totals, you can see that those numbers are not always the same for each land cover class. And this is due to errors in the classified pixels. So here you can see that all of the pixels off the diagonal in gray are the pixels that were incorrectly classified within the image. So for the urban class, for example, um, our map classified 45 of those correctly, but mis misclassified four pixels as agriculture, uh, 12 as forest, and 24 as bare ground. And so for the purposes of summarizing this overall accuracy, we divide the sum of the correctly classified pixels uh, by the number of total sampled pixels. Um, in our example error matrix, this means that we take the sum of the correctly classified pixels um, right there on that diagonal, and then we divide that by the total number, number of sam sampled pixels, um, which in this case is 336. So we then multiply this by 100 to obtain a percentage of overall accuracy, um, which in this case is 73%. And we usually consider an accuracy of 80% or higher as a successful land classification. Um, so in this particular case, we would likely want to adjust our classifier parameters um, or input more training data to obtain a higher percentage of overall accuracy. So a statistic you may also find useful for accuracy assessment is the Kappa statistic. Uh, Kappa takes into account the possibility of agreement between classifications and reference data occurring by chance and provides the proportion of agreement after chance agreement has been removed. It's calculated from the error matrix and will be relatively easy for us to tack onto our accuracy assessment and kappa values are from uh, negative one to one, and a higher kappa uh, means a higher agreement and thus accuracy of the classifier. On the right, you can see a breakdown of how we typically interpret kappa. Um, keep in mind that you would likely want to aim for value, values that fall within the substantial uh, to almost perfect agreement ranges. It's important to note that a common criticism of kappa is that it does not typically uh, provide you with much more information about accuracy. Um, than the overall accuracy assessment uh, calculated in the error matrix um, that we just went over. Um, but we think it's worth showing you the Kappa statistic function in Google Earth Engine um, just so that you have an example of applying a statistical function within the API. So Kappa is calculated using this equation. Uh, the observed accuracy is the sum of relative frequency in the diagonal of the error matrix, and chance agreement is the relative frequency of a random allocation of observations uh, to the cells of the error matrix. So to calculate kappa, the chance agreement is subtracted from the observed accuracy, and then the resulting value is divided by one minus the chance agreement. So we'll take a quick look at how this works uh, using our example error matrix. So you can see that the observed accuracy is the same calculation we used to calculate overall accuracy, and chance agreement is calculated by multiplying column totals by row totals, dividing each of these values by the total number of sampled pixels, and then adding each of the resulting values together. So the chance agreement is then subtracted from the observed accuracy, and then this value is divided by one minus the chance agreement value. So in this example, uh, we've obtained a kappa of 0.64, um, which indicates substantial agreement and thus accuracy um, in our classification. Now with reference to accuracy assessment in GEE specifically, an error or confusion matrix can be coded in Google Earth Engine uh, to test the agreement between our output classifications and reference data. And we can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is more of a quick sanity check um, just to test the quality of our, our training data 
in terms of its ability to actually train the classifier. So this is coded using the confusion matrix function um, to test the random forest classifier's ability uh, to correctly classify reference data that it has already seen, um, which in this case is the training data. And a better way to assess true accuracy is to test the trained algorithm's ability uh, to correctly classify reference points uh, that it has never seen before. So since the classifier has never seen this reference data, um, we can truly assess its ability uh, to correctly classify um, the land cover class. So there are a couple of ways to do this in Google Earth Engine. Uh, for our purposes, we will withhold a subset of the training data from the random forest classifier uh, to use later in an error matrix that assesses agreement between classifications and these previously unseen reference data points. And another way to do this um, is suggested by the GEE developers, um, and it's to use another land classification data set um, to compile reference data for use in an error matrix. Um, so I've shown an example here of the MODIS land cover product uh, that the developers use in some of their example script uh, to assess accuracy of their own random forest classification. Um, however, I think it's really important to note that while this might be easier, um, it's better to use reference data that you know to be true, uh, like field observations. And we can also quickly calculate uh, a kappa statistic um, for an error matrix using uh, the simple kappa function that we'll show you in Google Earth Engine. Now, I know we covered uh, these topics relatively quickly, um, so I've provided links to relevant past trainings here. And if you're interested in learning more about land cover classification and accuracy assessment, um, I really encourage you to take a look at the land cover classification with satellite imagery um, and accuracy assessment for, of a land cover classification uh, trainings available on our website. So for another example of a random forest classification in uh, GEE, you can also take a look at the remote sensing for mangroves in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals training. Um, and I believe they complete that random forest classification in session two, uh, but the whole training provides great information about the functionalities of Google Earth Engine, um, and they even go into app creation, uh, communication of data. Um, so it's a really valuable training to take a look at if you're interested in engaging with uh, GEE further. So you might have noticed that a lot of our credits link you uh, to the GEE developers website. Um, there's a number of guides, tutorials, and example scripts on this website that you might find useful um, that we've actually used uh, for certain parts of our JavaScript API activities. And I've included links specifically for the feature collections, uh, compositing, masking, and mosaicing, machine learning in Earth Engine, and supervised classification pages um, on the GEE developer webpage. Um, but I've also provided the link to the full list of guides and tutorials uh, made available by the developers. And these can be a really great place to start um, with GEE and can provide you with some pre-written scripts um, that you can adapt for your own work. All right, so that wraps up the slides portion of this session. For our activity in GEE, you want to use this link to follow along in the JavaScript API. If you weren't able to sign up for a Google Earth Engine account for whatever reason, uh, don't worry about it. Um, you can definitely just follow along on the screen, um, but make sure to sign up for that account before the next session if you can, um, so that you can follow along in the code editor yourself. So our guest speaker, Brittany Beaudry, uh, will be walking us through this activity. So Brittany, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you to get started. Um. Hello everyone, uh, as Zach stated, we'll be working out of Google Earth Engine today. So just as a quick reminder from the last session, uh, let's go over some areas of the code editor and interface again. So here in the center is the, the code editor. It's where you write and edit your code and where we'll spend a good amount of our time today with the code. And then above this here is the search bar. Um, here you can search 
for data sets that Earth Engine has loaded, and you can also search for locations uh, here as well. Below the code editor here uh, is the map. This is the map display. Uh, when you run your code, everything that you choose uh, the, the map to show uh, will show up down here. And then here on the left, you can pull out a left panel. And the first tab here is the scripts tab. Uh, it's where you can store your code and projects so that you can return to them when you'd like. And then the next tab here is the docs tab. Uh, this is all the documentation for Google Earth Engine. So it's where you can look up uh, functions for your code and find more information about, you know, proper use and syntax and stuff like that. And then next here is the assets tab. Uh, so here you can upload and manage assets in Earth Engine. Assets include things like images, geotips, uh, shape files, and tables. You can import these uh, into your codes and then use them for various purposes. Um, so also on the, uh, the right here, there's another panel. And uh, let's start with the inspector tab. Uh, this is where you can interact with the map below by clicking around. Um, it will give you the location and layer information um, about what's displayed and what you're clicking on. So the next tab is the console tab. Um, when you print something from your console, uh, like text or even objects or charts, um, they will show up there. It's interactive, so you can learn more about what you print here as well. So we'll be checking this tab a few times throughout our lesson today. And then the last tab here is the tasks tab, where you can export items or uh, run computations or tasks. And with all that said, I think we can get into the code today. So today we're going to be making a supervised land cover classification map of Cumberland County, Maine. So looking at the code editor here, up at the top, we see we have some imports. You can import an asset from the asset tabs uh, here on the left panel. You know, something like this. Or uh, you can call them into your code and import them from the code editor. Uh, our imports today include the shapefile of our study area, uh, Cumberland County, Maine. Uh, we named it here CC Maine for short. Here's a quick view of what it looks like. And you click on an asset, you might be able to kind of see what it looks like, and then as well as any properties or features. And the rest of the imports here are points that we're going to use uh, for training and testing the random forest model later in the script. So uh, let's start looking at some of this code. So part one here uh, is looking to add imagery, filter to the area and date range, mask out clouds, and make a composite. So the first section of code we're going to look at today are lines 9 and 10. So line eight is uh, just a comment here that tells us what we're going to do in this section. It's good practice to add comments to your code so that way you know um, what each section is trying to do. But to run our, our code, lines nine and 10 here, uh, we need to uncomment it. And you can do that a few different ways. Um, you can start by just backspacing and getting rid of these two slashes at the beginning of the, uh, the line here for each of the lines. Um, but you can also um, highlight it and then hit control slash if you have a Windows or con uh, command slash if you have a Mac. So whatever uh, way you like, let's uncomment lines 9 and 10 
so that they're not um, this green color and instead they're a different color. And let's see what's uh, happening in them. So here in line nine, uh, we're creating a variable using var, uh, and then we're naming the variable image right here. So here uh, we're saying that image is an image collection, ee dot image collection, and the image collection is Landsat 8, uh, tier 1 surface reflectance imagery. This is the same image collection that we used during the last session. Uh, so then here in line 10, we are using filter bounds to filter the image collection to an area. The area that we're filtering to is the CC main import uh, that we have up there at the top that we imported in um, our shapefile of Cumberland County, Maine. So here uh, within these two lines, we have created a variable called image uh, where uh, which is uh, the image collection of the Landsat 8 surface reflectance image collection. And we filtered the image collection just to our, uh, our study area, which is Cumberland County, Maine. So moving on to the next section of our code here, uh, we're going to be looking at lines 13 to 25. So let's uh, uncomment that section of the code now, 13 to 25. So remember, we can use backspace to just remove these comments. Or uh, we can use control slash on a window or command slash on a Mac. So let's do that. Give you some time to complete that as well. Um, okay, so here in this section of the code, uh, we are creating a function that mask, uh, masks clouds out of Landsat 8 surface reflectance data. So we do that by looking at the pixel QA bit mask band of our image collection. So let's look up our image collection here in the search bar to get a better understanding of uh, what we're looking to mask out and how we're going to do it. So I'm just going to look up this information, which is our image collection here. I'm going to look that up in the search bar. I just copied it, pasting it. So if you click on it here in the search bar um, and you go to the bands section, we're looking for the pixel QA uh, bit mask, which is right here. Um, pixel QA stands for Pixel Quality Assessment. So these data have been atmospherically corrected using the Landsat surface reflectance code, and it includes uh, things as clear, water, cloud shadow, snow, and cloud. And so what this essentially is, is looking at every single pixel, it's identifying whether um, the pixels contain clear imagery, if there's water in the image, if it's uh, a cloud shadow, if it's snow or cloud. So uh, knowing that each pixel has information about whether or not there is a cloud or cloud shadow in it, we can mask out that cloud or cloud shadow in our imagery by creating a function. So I'm going to hit close here. We're going to go back to our, our lines, 13 to 25, for our function. So uh, we start by defining that this is a function with the words function. And the name of the function is mask L8 surface reflectance right there. So uh, line 14 here is creating a variable called shadow cloud bit mask. And we're using the bitwise shift left operator here. Uh, to select the pixels that have the pixel QA value of 3, which when we looked it up here, um, 3 was a pixel that has a cloud shadow within it. And we're doing the same thing here in line 15. We're creating another variable called clouds bit mask, and we're using that bitwise uh, left shift to identify pixels that were labeled 5, meaning that uh, they had clouds in the pixel. 
uh, in line 17 here, uh, we're making a variable called QA. And again, we're selecting the pixel quality assessment band in the image. And then here in lines 19 and 20, uh, we create a variable called mask right here, our mask. Uh, that takes the QA variable we just made previously here in line 17 and uses bitwise and to select our clad cloud shadow bit mask and our cloud bit mask from above, the ones that uh, the pixels that have the cloud shadow in the cloud. Um, and we make them equal to zero. Oh, sorry, with these dot EQ zeros. Uh, therefore, we're taking these selected pixels that are identified as cloud and cloud shadow, and we're taking them out of the imagery or masking them out. Um, so by setting them equal to zero, we're indicating clear conditions for our pixels in our image collection. And then here in line 22, we are returning the masked image, dividing by 10,000 uh, to scale to reflectance without the uh, quality assessment bands. So we then copy the properties system time start uh, so that we can later filter by the dates within the data for our image collection. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next code section below. So, Let's uncomment our next section, which are lines 29 to 34. So here we are filtering imagery for 2019 and 2020 summer date ranges. We will then use that filter uh, to apply it to the image collection. So 19 to thir or tw sorry, 29 to 34. You can I again either just backspace the uh, the slashes out, control slash on a Windows or command slash on a Mac. So you see here in line 29, we're creating a variable and it's called sum 20 for summer 20. And we're using uh, ee.filter.date along with a date range. So uh, here's our beginning date range and here's our end date range. It's just the summer months uh, within uh, 2020. And then we're doing the same thing here in line 30 with the variable uh, summer 19, sum 19. We're using the same ee.filter.date and we're using the start and end date of the, the same months, um, but within 2019. So then in the next variable here on line 32, this variable sum filter equals ee.filter.or. And we're just using both of these two variables. So we're using both date ranges in the summer filter. This date range is a combination of just the summers of 2019 and 2020. So here on line 34, we are filtering image which was our image, our variable image way up here, back on line nine, that image collection filtered to main that we talked about. So we're filtering that to our summer filter. So that means we're taking that image from before and we're just filtering it to the summer date ranges. So our next lines, uh, this next section of code that we're working on, we're going to make a composite uh, if we're going to apply the cloud mask function, use the median reducer and clip the composite to our area of interest. So we're just going to unmask lines 38 to 41. Again, mask the, unmask those uh, how you like. What's happening in this line is we're creating a new variable. It's called composite. And we're using this image from before, all sum, meaning all of the summers. Um, and that's the image filtered to our summer date ranges. And we're mapping it. And uh, by using dot map, we're using that function that we created earlier, mask L8 SR, and we're masking out the clouds out of that imagery. So we're using that cloud mask function on our summer imagery of our study area. And then we're using dot median just to, as a reducer to reduce it to an image. 
And then we're clipping the image again just to our study area, CC main. And that's our, our new variable. It should just be an image of a composite of uh, our image of the summer masked without the clouds in our study area, which brings us to uh, line 44. We're going to unmask this one because we're going to display the composite down within our, our map area. So once you uh, uncomment this line here, line 44, we can hit run up at the top here, the top right, run. And now what's important about this line is we hit, uh, we're using map.addLayer. So we're adding the layer composite and we're using the bands, band uh, three, four, and two for some true color imagery. We're naming it Cumberland Cumber, uh, Cumberland Color Image. And then the zero at the end here means that it's not going to initially show up, even though we've run it and it's run successfully. If you go to layers, you can see Cumberland's color image has shown up, uh, but we need to click on it in order for it to appear. So again, just clicking on it, you can scroll up here. And here's our color image of Cumberland County. You can zoom in or out. It just might have to reload. But here's what it looks like. And then you can change the uh, capacity if you want to look at something beneath, uh, which is typically what people do with multiple layers, things like that. But there is our color image of Cumberland County. Filtered again just to Cumberland County, and it's the composite of the summer images masked without those clouds. All right. So this part two uh, for this section, uh, we're interested in classifying uh, vegetated data. So for the purpose of identifying and classifying developed land, uh, we're going to import data directly from the USGS National Lands Cover Database right from Earth Engine. So we're going to uh, map urban development at varying scales using this data. So um, our random forest model is just for vegetated areas, but this is an example of how you can use pre-existing layers in Earth Engine as a way to uh, supplement your own land classification. So this can be helpful for working around features that you don't want to map uh, or maybe you want to mask out or even just reduce the need to map uh, out features that you're not interested in for your specific work. So we're going to look at lines 50 to 54 here and we're going again to just unmask I mean, not unmask, uncomment. And uh, let's look at exactly what I'm talking about here with the USGS National Land Cover Database. You can type in USGS NLCD, and we're looking at the, the top one here. And again, this is just the, the National Land Cover Database. Specifically, uh, we're going to be importing uh, the impervious uh, mapped area of our study area. So this is uh, typically developed surfaces, uh, you know, sort of man-made things, and it's on a scale of uh, 1 to 100 percent impervious. So we're going to be segmenting that into a couple different layers of uh, developed land for our, our classification here later. So let's just start by uh, adding the impervious surface layer. So here on line 50, uh, once you've uncommented your code, we're going to start with uh, the variable impervious. And that's just the image collection up here that we just looked up. And then we're going to filter it uh, to a date range. This is the most updated version, the most recent uh, version of the impervious layer. It's from 2016 to 2017. So that's our date range that we're uploading. And then we're filtering the bounds here on line 52. Again, we're just filtering the area just to our study area, Cumberland County, Maine. 
and we are selecting impervious. Again, we're just selecting the land cover type that is the impervious surface, uh, the developed areas. And then we're using dot map, and we are just returning the image of uh, the impervious area within our Cumberland main study area. So from here, we currently have it as an image collection and we're looking to reduce it uh, just to a single image. So we're doing that here in line 57. So if you uncomment that line, uh, the variable reduced is just impervious. Again, our last, our last variable here, the image collection, and we're using the dot reduce uh, function. And then median, we're just taking the median of, of the filter date here. And then um, the next section of code here, just line 60, we're masking out the zero values in the data. So here uh, on the variable masked, we're taking reduced, which is just that image. And we're using dot self mask here. That's just taking out any values in the data that are zero. It's just removing them because we're not interested in them. Okay, so um, I was referring to these values up here. These are the values for the land cover uh, classifications from these feature collections uh, with one to 100 being the percents in pervious surfaces, um, 100 to coniferous, all the way to 105 water, 106 years from a previous land cover classification. Um, we have masked out the cloud to this point, so we don't need to identify them. Um, moving onwards, uh, we're looking to merge the land cover classifications into one feature class. So let's uncomment line 75 here and look at what's happening. So we're using the variable var, uh, using var, we're naming the variable new FC for new feature class. So we are merging these land cover classifications into one feature class. So we're looking at the ones we were just looking at before, you know, uh, coniferous, and then we're using dot merge, and we're merging it with mixed forest, and we're just uh, using dot merge, and all of the land classifications that we're looking to use for random forest classification today. Um, and while they're all merged into one feature class, they are still all saving these uh, land cover values. So they're not all the same value. They're all going to maintain their original values here of 101 to 105. So here in line 78, uh, we're going to specify the bands to use in the prediction. So let's uncomment line 78 here. And here we're just using the variable bands and we're using bands three, four, five, six, and seven for our random forest classification. Again, this section of the code is just preparing for it. And then here we are making training data by overlaying the points on the image. So let's uncomment lines 81 to 85. I'm going to be doing that by using control slash, but you're welcome to, again, just backspace as well as use command slash if you have a Mac. So here on line 81, we're using the variable points. So we're selecting our composite, our image, our variable above composite, if you remember, and we're selecting the bands here. We're selecting the bands from that image and then we're using dot sample regions. And then with our collection here, uh, new FC, new feature class, this was this up here, all of our, our, merged, uh, our merged land cover classifications. This is the set of geometries that we're selecting for our training today. And underneath that is the uh, line 83. The property we're using is land cover. This is the label from each of the geometries, the number 101 to 105. That's where we're selecting them. And then we're using the scale of 30. So we're making sure to sample from the same size as a Landsat pixel. 
Landsat imagery is 30 meters, so our scale is also 30. <clears throat> and then we are using dot random column. So this creates a column with random numbers. Uh, the random values are used to divide your sample into training uh, and validation sets, which is something that we're going to be using in the next section of code below. So let's scroll to that, and let's also clean up down here. I'm going to get rid of the geometry imports, and I'll go back to the map just to clear up the imagery down below in case it's a little distracting or it's making your uh, your editor a little slow. I think it might be making mine a little bit slow. All right. So uh, this next section of code here, we're going to be uncommenting lines 89 to 91. So let's do that now and explore what's going on here. So uh, in this section, we are randomly splitting the samples to get some aside for testing uh, the model's accuracy. We're using the random column from above. So uh, we're using all features with random values. Again, this random column uh, less than um, 0 0.8, so we're splitting it 80-20%. So anything less is going to be for training. And then the remaining 20% that we use is going to be for testing. So it's randomized. And so these are just the two subsets of the training data. Oh, sorry, these are the two subsets of the training data. And then here uh, on the area below, we are just printing these variables just to uh, actually get a number for how much training and testing data we will be using in each of these subsections. So let's uncomment that and unpack it a bit. So let's uncomment lines uh, 94 to 96. All right, so these are all print statements. Again, print statements are going to show up right here on the console on the right once we run our code again. So line 94 here is printing samples. Um, so what it is is it's points, and we're getting the count for all of the points. So what is points again? That's this up here. These are, again, just all of the points that we're utilizing uh, for our classification. So we're just printing the amount of points that we're using for our selection. And then here, uh, training and testing, we are just printing the aggregate count of all of the training points and all of the testing points that we are going to be using for our random forest classification. So let's run this and see uh, what it prints. Again, you just hit run up here. So let's see, it's computing right here. You can see it spinning away. Okay, so um, after a bit, we now see that we have um, 1,067 samples that we're going to be using for a random forest classification. 865 of them are used for training, and then 202 are what we are saving for testing, which will bring us to our, our next section here, which is part four, random forest classification and accuracy assessments. So let's uncomment the first section here. And these are lines uh, 102, oh, no, sorry, 103 to 107. So let's uncomment lines 103 to 107. So let's look at what's going on. So we're using the variable classifier. 
And here we are using ee.classifier.smileRandomForest. So we're using a random forest model. And then these 305. So we're using 300 trees and the five randomly selected predictors per split, as we discussed, or as Zach discussed in the, uh, the trees and the splitting during his, his lesson earlier. So then we're tr uh, going to train using bands in land cover property and pull the land cover property from the classes. So again, on line 103, uh, we have the variable classifier and it, we're just identifying yeah, where you're going to be using the random forest classifier in Google Earth Engine. It's just called dot smile random forest. And we're using 300 trees with five randomly selected predictors. And then we're using dot train. So the features that we're using are training. Again, that's our training data from up here on line 90. These are the points. And again, these are the 865 uh, points here. That's what we're using for our training data for a random forest. And then the class property that we're looking at is land cover. Those values, um, 101 to 105, depending on the different, different classes that we're looking to classify today. And then the input properties on lines 106 are bands. If you remember, that was the variable up at the top here. Let's see, line 78, just bands three through seven. So we're preparing our, our random forest. So let's, uh, let's add something here to test the accuracy of the model. So we're gonna start here with lines uh, one, 13 to lines 117. Let's uncomment that. Okay. So let's start uh, with here, line 113, variable confusion matrix. We're uh, running classifier dot confusion matrix. Again, classifier was just our a random forest model up here, and then dot confusion matrix. Um, uh, a confusion matrix, uh, it will compute a uh, confusion matrix uh, for the random forest classifier here based on our training data. Um, the axis of the matrix corresponds to the input classes, uh, the rows and columns start at class zero and then increase sequentially up to the maximum class value. So uh, some rows or columns might be empty if the input classes aren't zero based or sequential. But uh, this first confusion matrix here is just a basic sanity check. Uh, it's just to make sure that the classifier is working well. And if training data had a high enough quality to actually train the classifier. So uh, here we're just using a print function. Again, that's gonna show up on the right here on the console. So it's just going to print this confusion matrix here and we're gonna get that, that matrix with all the values, just our sanity check. And then here on line 115, um, it's another print statement and we are printing the training overall accuracy and we're printing, uh, that's the words that we're printing, but the value is the confusion matrix dot accuracy. So confusion matrix, confusion matrix dot accuracy here uh, creates a new floating point number indicating the accuracy of a confusion matrix. It's computed as the number of correct classifications divided by the total number of classifications. And then here on line 116, we have a variable called kappa and that's confusion matrix dot kappa. So as Zach stated before, um, kappa is an agreement between classifications and reference data that we believe to be true. It's essentially evaluating how well the classification is performing as compared to, you know, something just randomly assigning values. So confusion matrix dot kappa uh, creates a new floating point number indicating the kappa statistic for a specified uh, for a the specified confusion matrix 
and this measures the agreement between two data sets on a scale that generally ranges from zero to one. Uh, to interpret the kappa value, anything from 0.6 to 0.8 is substantial, and anything above 0.8 is very good or an almost perfect agreement. And again, line 117, we are just printing it, and it's called training kappa. So that print statement should just give the kappa value here on the console. So uh, here we would assume uh, this next part to be a much better test as we withheld 20% of our points, if you remember. So we are using them now uh, in an error matrix and an accuracy assessment to test the classifier's ability to classify points that weren't used to originally train the classifier. So it hasn't seen these before. So this gives us a more accurate view of the classifier in general. So by looking at the agreement between the classifier we trained and the reference data that is completely new to the classifier, um, it's going to be a much better test of accuracy for this random forest classifier that we're using today. So starting on line 119, we're creating a variable called validation, and we're using that testing data from up above, if you remember testing. So these were the ones that we did not use, the 20% here, the 202 points. And we're going to classify them with the classifier up above. Again, we're just running them. And then we are running an error matrix on them in the next line, uh, 120. So we're again just doing an accurate assessment on these this 20% of the code or of the points that uh, the classifier has not seen before. So this is the test accuracy. And an error matrix <clears throat> is just like a confusion matrix. Um, it computes uh, an error matrix for collection by comparing two columns. Um, you get, as a result, a confusion matrix representing the expected accuracy. And so then we have print statements again, just to print these to the console so we can see their values. So the one here is we're printing and we're labeling it validation error matrix RF. And we're just printing test accuracy right here. And then we're also printing the validation overall accuracy. And that's the test accuracy using the dot accuracy afterwards. And then on lines 123 and 124, we're running that kappa statistic again on test accuracy. This validation, um, the classifier from our testing data, we're just running the kappa statistic again, and then we're printing it again, of course, to see it here on our console. <clears throat> so let's run this. So we're going to get a few more print statements here. And these are going to be our, our accuracy assessments. Um, so now that all of our statements here have printed, let's look at what our, our results are. So looking here, this is our confusion matrix from line 114. Here is again just the confusion matrix in all of the elements, and followed by the overall uh, training accuracy from line 115. So that's currently 99.7%. And then the uh, training kappa value here is represented as 0.9. Um, and then this next section here is the area that we assumed uh, would be a much better test as we are looking at that, that testing area. So first is the, the error matrix for the validation, which we're printing here on line 121. It's again very similar to the confusion matrix, of course, as you can see. They're very long. You can, you're welcome to explore them. But I'm just going to close them up now just to make it easier to scroll here, followed by the validation overall accuracy for the random forest. So uh, right now it's 79.7. So if we round that up to an 80, we'll just squeak on by. Usually you're looking for a uh, an overall accuracy of about 80 or higher. 
and then followed by the kappa value here, which is 0.6. And again, uh, everything from 0.6 and higher, you can kind of consider a substantial agreement. So again, if you wanted to improve these values, again, you probably want it a little higher than this for the overall accuracy. You can do that just by adding more points. And um, again, uh, we only have about a thousand here. That's you know kind of low if you're looking to do very in-depth random forest classification. Um, so I definitely recommend adding more points and looking at you know high-res satellite imagery to really make sure that the points you are selecting um, are as accurate as possible for your model. And then here, um, on line 127, make sure it's uncommented. Um, on line 127, we are just applying the classifier to, to our image. And remember, our, our image is the Cumberland, com, uh, Cumberland color image from earlier. So we're applying our classifier to that. So here, um, with composite uh, dot select, bands, we're selecting the predictors, and uh, with dot classify and then classifier, we're classifying or we're applying the random forest uh, classifier, which, which is up here, the classifier. We're running that random forest model on our composite and we're naming it classified. So we're running our model. So part five, let's create a legend for our map. So once we uh, we print our map or we present our map down below of our random forest classification, we can uh, better understand what each color in each section is going to look like, right, for our, our different layers or our different uh, land cover types. So to create a legend, we're going to start by setting the position of the panel and you're going to do that by uncommenting lines 133 to 138. So I'll let you do that. So uh, we start on line 133 just by making a variable called legend. And then we're using ui.panel. We're creating a little panel down below. It'll show up right around here because we're using position bottom left. So style, again, this is the style. This is sort of Looking at the visualizations of the legend already, a lot of this part five here is going to be looking at visualizations for the, the legend. So with the style, the position is going to be bottom left. In the padding is uh, looking at kind of the size, pixels. Um, I selected eight by 15. You're welcome to play around with those and see how the, the size and position of the panel changes as you change different things. but for now, we can just expect it down there. So for our next section, we're going to create a legend title. And we're going to do that by uncommenting lines 141 to 149. So again, I'm uncommenting by control slash because I have a Windows. Um, if you have a Mac, again, just command slash or you can backspace each line. So what's happening here is uh, in line 141, we're creating another variable called legend title. And uh, that's just we're using uh, ui.label. So the value or what the title is actually going to say, it will say classification legend. And then for some more style, we have the font weight. We're making the font bold. The font size will be 18. And then the margin, meaning how far the uh, the font will be from the edges of the legend. So I just have it as four here, and I don't have any padding in this area. Again, each of these kind of have a little bit of a different effect on the legend. You're welcome to play around with them, but I'm just going to keep these as is for now. And so now we're adding the title uh, to the panel. Again, nothing's going to show up down here until we until we run it. Um, but let's start by uncommenting line 152. So um, we're just going to do legend.add, and we're adding that legend title up here. So, and then this section is creating and styling a row of the legend. So this is a lot of a lot of styles 
and information for the legend. Um, so even though you're styling it technically for one row, it's going to apply for the entirety of the legend. So let's start by uncommenting. This is a big section here. Uh, line 155 to 174. So I'll give you some time to, to do that. So in line 155 here, we're using the variable uh, just called make row. And this whole section here is a big function. So uh, what we're looking to do here is, again, we're just uh, making a row, and then we're going to use it for all of our rows for all of our land cover types later. But again, this is just very style specific. So starting at line 157, we're looking at the uh, color box. Uh, we're creating a variable called color box. Again, it's just another label. And this is actually going to be sort of the background of the area. So we're choosing background, which is uh, just a little hashtag here plus color. We'll see that down here in a bit. Uh, and then the padding and the margin again, just keeping it the same as um, up above. So it looks, you know, all nice and neat in a row, which you'll see once we run it. And then uh, here in line 165, we're having a description. And again, it's just the the label and the value is name, which is going to come up down below as well. And then the style, again, we're just keeping it sort of similar. I think uh, this is added here just to make sure that there's enough uh, width for the names. And then here on line 170 is just <clears throat> returning the panel. The widgets are, again, color box and description. We're making sure this is added to the to our, our um, legend. And then the layout is we're just having it horizontal. So we're having everything present itself horizontally below. So here is uh, on these new lines, we're adding some of these that are mentioned up here. So again, this is the function. And we're going to uh, put these into the function. So let's uncomment line 177. So this is our variable palette. So this is the palette for the legend colors. These are the colors that we're going to be using in our legend, as well as the colors that we're going to be using in our map of our random forest model. So these look kind of weird. Uh, they're just some random letters and numbers, but these are hex codes. Hex codes are just six uh, letters and numbers that identify a color. Um, there's a lot of places online where you can look up um, good hex code combinations or look up hex codes specifically. These hex codes, as you're going to see when we um, kind of run our, our map down below, are uh, combinations of blues and greens, uh, purple and a little bit of yellow. So uh, this comes into color box here. So it's usually like a, a hashtag or a pound followed by these numbers and that's that's the typical hex code so by running this function we don't have to run this over and over for every single color we're just putting this variable palette through the function and applying this every single time which is a great way to save space on code and we're doing the same thing here on lines 80 and 81 so let's uncomment that however you'd like and so this is the variable names. So this shows up um, here as well. And these are the names for all of the different uh, land cover classes that we have. Again, these are the, the same as the geometry imports, uh, cultivated, water, deciduous, coniferous, and mixed forest, as well as um, the uh, density development, the imperia, uh, impervious layer that we have and we're mixing them low, medium, and high density development. So let's check here uh, lines 184 to 186. Let's uncomment that. So we're adding the color and the names. So let me. So this is just um, stating how many rows we're going to have in our in our rows up here. Again, that this function here just created one row. So we're kind of saying that we actually want uh, eight rows, which is that here. And so we're making sure that we have eight rows. And 
the palette and the names correspond here. They're included. Um, and again, uh, the value here for the color is responsible for the um, name that is at the same point in it. So the first palette's color here will correspond to the first name here. The second color here will correspond to the second name here and so on and so forth for all types. And then we're going to add the legend to the map, which we're just using, uh, which we're just running on line 189, map.add, and we're adding our legend. So let's uncomment that. Now let's hit run, and we should see our legend right away. It might take a little bit to load. But... Okay, so here's our legend. Um, here's all the rows, all of the colors from the palette, and then all of the, the uh, land cover classes. So our last uh, section here is part six and it is display the final lands cover classification. Um, so we're going to start by uh, creating a palette for the final lands cover map classifications. It's, um, of course, good practice to make sure that these colors and these titles are uh, combined with our own map itself. So this is uh, actually SLD style. But let's just uncomment, then we can kind of dive in. So we're going to uncomment lines 195 to line 207. So I'll give you some time to uncomment that. So this is uh, so many colors for our, our map, our final land cover map, um, that it's in a, a CSS style. So uh, it's a variable and it's called urban palette. So for each lands cover type that we're looking to map today, we're making sure that there's the color, the quantity, and then the label. So this is where our uh, low, mid, and high density development will appear for our, our lands cover um, impervious surface. So low is anything from, so these are just the highest values. So anything from one to 22% impervious is considered low density. Anything from 23 to the highest value of 56 is considered mid density. And then finally, um, anything from 57 to 100% impervious from our impervious surface layer will be considered high density development. And then these other values, again, were just the values that we that we assigned to our, our uh, imports here, our points. So 101 to 105 again. So these are the colors that we're going to be using. And then uh, we're looking here to mask out the uh, impervious surface. We're just going to blend our impervious surface uh, data here with our random forest classification. We're just going to use dot blend. So if you remember, classified is our random forest classification. And by uh, we're going to use dot blend to add masked, which if you remember from way up in the code, is our impervious surface layer masked without the zero. So it's just uh, percent impervious in our study area. So with our final map, we're using our random forest classified imagery called classified, and we're just adding that impervious surface area or imagery. And so now we're going to uh, add the final map to the display. So this is on line uh, 213. So let's uncomment that. And we're just again using map.addLayer. And we're adding the final map here. And then the dot SLD style urban palette, that's referring to this. So in the SLD style, we are utilizing this for the colors and the quantities that we want to be assigned to the colors. These land cover classifications are being assigned to these colors, which uh, is good practice. We're making sure are the exact same as what's within our legend. And then we are just 
uh, naming it land classification, similar to how we named our Cumberland County imagery, Cumberland color image, lands our land classification will just come up here, it's land classification. And so then we're going to center the map for the display. And you can do that just by running map.setCenter. And then this is just um, some, this is just a point within the center of our, our map, just uh, to give us a good uh, centralized imagery for our final product. And then this number 10 here is just the zoom level. So this will just make sure that uh, we can see it fully. You're welcome to change the zoom level and see if you like it zoomed in or out better, but just automatically setting these things so that the map shows up right away, right where you want it is, is a good way to not lose your place when you, you're running and printing things. So with all of that being said, we can now run our map all the way up here. And we should be able to see our supervised land cover classification. It might take a little minute to uh, to run everything. There's a lot of code going on here. So, and again, as we we do rerun everything, these these samples and these values are going to come up again. So keep that in mind. But let me just get a nice good look at our final product here. almost done loading but uh, as you can see this is our our land cover classification through the random forest model thanks to our legend we can tell what each one is classified as i think it's fun if you uh actually load the cumberland color image underneath and then you can uh play with this and kind of see how well it's actually classifying things. Feel free to, you know, zoom in and, and see how well some parts are being classified. I think some parts are classifying better than other, and it's just a, a great way again to see how well things are being classified and where you should add more training points. You know, what is it classifying incorrectly? And how should you, you know, add a training point there to make sure that it is classifying incorrectly and you know, really increase that that overall classification for your model. And with that, I believe that this section uh, of the code for supervised land cover classification of uh, Cumberland County, Maine is complete. Okay, uh, and with that being said, I will pass it on to Zach. Awesome, thanks for the excellent demonstration, Brittany. Um, and that concludes our second session in the GEE land monitoring series. Uh, here's a quick summary of the material we covered in this session. Uh, we went over some of the basics of land classification and accuracy assessment. Uh, we examined the use of supervised land classifications and how to complete them in GEE using machine learning algorithms, uh, taking a closer look at the decision tree-based random forest algorithm. And we also went over the use of an error or confusion matrix for the accuracy assessment of classifications. And in our JavaScript API activity, we completed a supervised land cover classification for Cumberland County, Maine, where we imported and processed Landsat 8 surface reflectance data, uh, trained the random forest classifier using reference data points, uh, ran the classifier to create our final land classification map, and assessed the accuracy of our classifications using an error matrix. So don't forget to join us for session three next week. Um, where we'll take a look at ways to use GEE for time series analysis and change detection. And for those interested in a certificate of completion for this series, there will be one homework assignment uh, that I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, answers must be submitted via Google Form, uh, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. And the due date uh, for the homework assignment is July 14th. Uh, this is two weeks after the close of the webinar series, and a certificate of completion uh, will be awarded to those who attend all of the live webinars and complete the homework assignment uh, by the deadline of July 14th. And you'll receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinesse Martins. 
And here's our contact info again, uh, just in case you have any questions about today's session um, that we don't cover in the Q&A. Um, and we'll also provide links, uh, and we've also provided links uh, to the training page, uh, the RSET website, um, and our social media. And we really encourage you to follow us on Twitter uh, to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. So thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed the session. Um, and a special thanks to our guest speaker, Brittany Beaudry from the NASA DEVELOP program. Um, and thank you to John Dilger from the Spatial Informatics Group and Abigail Berenblit from NASA Goddard, uh, who helped us with the JavaScript API activity. Um, and now we'll go ahead and move right on into our Q&A session. All right, hello everyone. Um, just give us a second to, to switch over to some screen mirroring. Let's see. All right. So hopefully you can see uh, my GEE code editor. Uh, can someone just confirm real quick that you can see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so we want to first clear up a couple of things. Um, it seems like some of you are really following along with us, and we really appreciate that. Um, and just as a testament to how closely you were following along, some of you caught a, a quick error that we had in one line of our code um, that we just wanted to sort real quick. Um, and that was in line 30, which I have highlighted here. Um, we had just a quick little typo of one of our dates in our image date filtering. Um, I believe it was this section right here um, we had as uh, 2020-09-30. Um, it should have been 2019 because we were filtering for uh, all of the summer, summer months within 2019, um, which is an excellent reminder to just go ahead and make sure you check your code multiple times for errors. Um, little things like that can definitely pop up. Um, but for the purposes of this, um, everything that we did uh, within the majority of the demonstration and everything that Brittany showed you should have run just fine. Um, your results will just end up being a little bit different. So if you want to just quickly change that from 2020 to 2019 right here, um, that'll give you the appropriate summer um, aggregation of each of those seasons between the two years. Um, and then you should be able to run the code again. I quickly reran that just to take a look at our classification map. Um, it looks pretty similar, a little bit different. Um, and that's just because the pixels that were chosen to do the classification on are different in terms of seasonality now. Um, so once you make that quick alteration, um, everything should have gone as planned. Um, and then as another... Uh, point to mention, uh, some of you noticed that the printed numbers that you had um, from things like looking at the samples, uh, the testing and training data were a little bit different, um, numbers within the training overall accuracy, the, the error matrix um, information were a little bit different. In terms of uh, how we aggregated uh, those training and testing points, if you were noticing different numbers of sample points, training points, or testing points, um, that's probably because uh, as we've done different iterations of practicing for, <laughs> for this session, we've probably added a couple points in there a few times. Um, you may have also added some of your own points to some of those training data um, if you were going into uh, the map window and adding a couple of vector points in there as well. Um, so if you had different numbers there um, for samples, training, testing, uh, these numbers right here, don't worry about that. That shouldn't have really affected anything um, for you walking through the code with us. And then if you're noticing any differences in the uh, training overall accuracy numbers, uh, training kappa, validation error matrix, um, overall accuracy, these numbers here, um, that's probably just because when you run it at different times of day or, or in different time periods, um, for example, we ran it at a different time than you might have, um, these numbers can vary just because the matrices recalculate themselves and sometimes there's variation um, depending on um, the iterations of those calculations. So you should receive numbers that are pretty similar. Um, in this case, since I changed that um, time aggregate here just to the summer months of 2019 um, for that line 30 of code, uh, the validation overall accuracy changed for me um, as well as the training overall accuracy and they were a little bit higher. Um, so if you're seeing variations there, any large variations say on the order of uh, like 90% instead of this like 82% might be more cause for concern. But if you're getting something within say a few percentage points um, or something that you could easily round to the same number that we, we have around 80%, um, you should in theory be fine for those numbers as well. All right, so I hope that clears up some of the 
the issues that you guys noticed within the code editor. Um, so we'll go ahead and transition over to the Q&A doc and just give me one quick second to go ahead and pass over sharing uh, back to Selwyn so we can mirror the Q&A doc. All right. So we'll go ahead and get situated here to answer some of all of your questions. Um, as I think Jonathan mentioned in the chat, we had a, a pretty large number of questions. Um, so we won't be able to get to all of them today, but we'll definitely try to go through each of them in the Q&A doc so that we answer um, all of the questions that we're able to in the Q&A doc. And then if there's anything that we're not able to get to, you, you all have our emails. So please definitely feel free to email us with any questions that we can cover. So we can go ahead and get started with question one, which is how do we know of all the built-in functions in Google Earth Engine? Awesome, so you can use the docs tab um, in the GEE JavaScript API that Brittany showed us uh, again at the beginning of her code demo. Um, and this tab allows you to click through or search all of the functions available in GEE. And you might also wanna reference the API guides uh, found here by, uh, by the GEE developers on their website. And so I provided a link there for you to take a look at that. Um, that docs tab is really helpful for any functions that you're looking for. If there's a specific uh, function that you wanna do, you can enter a keyword and that will typically um, point you in the right direction uh, to which function you might wanna use. And question two, for binary classifications, should I provide training samples for both classes? So our short answer to this is yes, um, we would recommend providing training data for any classes that you'd like to identify. Um, this just really improves the algorithm's ability to differentiate between classes, uh, making your classifications more accurate. So in this case, uh, you might be interested in only identifying one land cover type or even one set of uh, plant types, like say you're interested in aspen tree stands or something like that. But we would also recommend that you provide training data for other land classifications uh, just because that, that really improves the ability of that machine learning algorithm to be able to differentiate between pixels. Um, and it's really kind of back to that, that same principle of the more training data that you're able to provide, typically the better uh, the machine learning that your algorithm completes will be. Awesome, so for question three, would you need to use polygons for training data or what sort of format is needed? So you can either use polygons or points for your training data, um, but these geometries just have to have a known land cover type. So this is your, your reference training data, um, where in theory you know exactly what land cover type on the ground exists at that point or polygon. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of uh, land classifications use polygons. These are a really great way um, to kind of aggregate pixel information um, across um, an entire subsection of a land class within your imagery. Uh, points are sometimes a little bit less commonly used. We used them in this case because we were interested in that fine differentiation uh, between coniferous trees and deciduous trees. Um, and then we also had a mixed forest classification. So for our purposes, using point data was a little bit easier because um, given the, the prevalence of mixed forest in this case, um, we were able to pick out individual pixels that we could identify as solely coniferous, solely deciduous, um, or that mixed forest class. So it kind of depends on what you're doing with your classification um, and what ends up being a little bit easier um, for your purposes. All right, let's see. Awesome. So question four. For supervised classification, if we zoom in to look at the pixels, many would have an overlapping color or some mixed color. Um, how do we ensure that each pixel gets classified correctly into the classes? So in today's session, each pixel is definitively assigned to a specific class. Um, since that's a uh, pixel-based classification, we're classifying pixel by pixel. Um, so I think if you're referring to uh, speckling or pixels of different classes being uh, grouped together in a way that appears to have too much variation for, for say, that segment of the landscape. Um, there are definitely methods to do some smoothing out of classifications to reduce this type of speckling uh, based off of the distance of pixels to one another. Um, and so this might be a function that you're also familiar with in like a, a desktop GIS platform. Um, basically, 
tying pixels that might have been misclassified to nearby land classifications of more pixels. Um, and we'll try to look up some more methods of this um, and include some links here after the session. And if anybody else has uh, any information on this, any of our other panelists or organizers, definitely feel free to jump in. Hey, hey, Zach, just to tack mm -hmm. on to that, there is a um, unmix function for spectral mm -hmm. unmixing where you can pass in them and members. Awesome. Thanks, John. Perfect. So we'll look up a little bit more information about that unmixing function, and we'll definitely provide it here after the session's over. All right, question five. So if you have a large set of files, is it possible to upload to GEE without having to do each one individually? So I think it depends on the, the type of file that you're looking to upload and how your data is organized within a, a file structure. Um, but I would say that we usually recommend uploading uh, distinct geometries and image collections separately, uh, just because this allows you to share them individually and, and include them in your script on a case-by-case -case basis. And John, I don't know if you have more experience with that and would like to comment on that as well. Okay, cool. So we'll just go ahead and move to question six. So within Landsat data, how, to, how do you set up the date range in Google Earth Engine to compute a yearly time series land use land cover map? So hopefully address, we addressed how some of this works. Um, within the code demonstration, uh, but you can filter date ranges uh, for the Landsat data set according to your own specifications. Um, so for example, um, you could create images uh, that average the highest quality pixels for all summer months of each year um, from 2015 to 2020. It basically just depends on how you're manipulating that, that total image collection of, of all the Landsat data that's available to you. And you can cre create uh, date aggregates of um, yearly pixel information we typically do something like that on us on a seasonal level um, so in this case we used uh, summer dates and for that you would just want to filter your image collection say however many number of times it takes you to get each of those yearly composites um, and then map your land cover classifications over each of those distinct years to get a time series of land cover Awesome. So question seven. Can you explain a little bit more about this idea of a black box? Uh, how are the algorithms used unknown to us? So I, I apologize if my description in the presentation was a little bit unclear about this, um, but we do in fact know what the algorithm is um, and what it's doing. As we saw in the slides describing how the random forest algorithm works, uh, but we're not able to observe um, this going on kind of as it's happening um, with the algorithm. So that basically just means that we're able to observe its performance uh, by examining the accuracy um, and thereby success of its outputs. So hopefully that, that clears it up a little bit. Basically what we mean by that black box is that we know what the algorithm itself is doing, we just can't necessarily observe it doing those things as it's happening. Um, and our best way to approximate how successful that algorithm was, was to take a look at its outputs um, and assess those for accuracy. And question eight, which classifier is better to identify a single crop for the crop type mapping? Uh, can we follow the same code and same methodology given in this webinar, or should we consider including different data? What are the key points for crop type mapping? So there isn't necessarily a perfect answer to this question. Um, it really depends on the, the data that you have available for training um, and what statistical approach ends up working best for you. So in Google Earth Engine, um, in terms of selecting a machine learning algorithm. You could definitely attempt uh, this classification in a few chosen algorithms like random forest, cart, or SVM, and then assess the accuracy of classifications of each of those, and then just end up choosing whichever one has the best performance in your case. 
Um, so you could kind of use the, the code that we provided today as a skeleton for a, a crop type land classification map, um, but you definitely want to change your uh, training data. So for something where you're looking at uh, crop type mapping, you're going to want to have good either ground or really high resolution imagery uh, reference data where you can pick out training points that are of different crop types for your land cover classifications. Um, training data is really what teaches the algorithm um, what to classify and how to classify it. Um, so for instance, in the code that we provided today, we have a series of land classifications that wouldn't necessarily be very helpful for crop type mapping. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you get some better reference data for training, um, which will ultimately be more crop focused. Okay, question nine. How do we know which type of classification is best for a particular area? When would you use the different types of classifiers, random forest versus cart versus SVM and night base? Any reference documents we could further explore on this topic? Is there a paper that assesses the fit for different classification models? Um, so each type of classifier definitely has its own pros and cons. Um, so it's definitely on that case by case basis that I think we mentioned in the crop example um, to know which one to select. Uh, this article here takes a look at classifiers in Google Earth Engine and how they classify uh, multi, multi temporal satellite imagery for crop mapping, um, which you might find useful. And that's probably also useful for that question eight. Um, so we definitely recommend taking a look at the literature, finding out what the advantages and disadvantages of each of uh, the classifiers are. Um, you'll, you'll likely find a lot of information about random forest. Um, it's, it's kind of one of the more popular algorithms at this moment for land classification. Um, and it's something that is pretty well utilized within Google Earth Engine. And so uh, definitely take a look at this pa paper for uh, classifier uh, selection. All right, question 10. With the Landsat data set, how do we set the date range in GEE to compute a yearly time series land use land cover map? So I think this, this brings up a good distinction as well. Um, when we're doing these land classifications, um, especially in our case, we're typically just mapping land cover. Land use and land cover obviously are typically uh, pretty intertwined, but for, the, for our purposes, we're really focusing on, on land cover, not necessarily ascribing a specific land use to that. Um, but if you wanted to do this on a yearly time series, I think I probably answered that sufficiently enough in one of the questions earlier. Um, but basically what you would do is you would just change your image collection filtering, um, select some sort of uh, yearly aggregate, and then map your land cover classification over each of those um, yearly composite images. And you don't necessarily have to create a composite per year if there's a a really good image from like a say a single Landsat scene that you're interested in, you can always use that. Um, something that's just representative of each year. Question 11, what are your suggestions to solve the memory limit error when running ensemble machine learning algorithms such as eeclassifier.smilegradienttreeboost over extensive land areas? So working around scaling errors can be really difficult, um, but one way is to export the imagery um, you're using for the algorithm and import it as an Earth Engine asset. Um, and you can also increase the scale of the machine learning algorithm, um, but keep in mind how that might affect your results. So something that we've noticed in the past is when, say you have a, a, a large composite that's taking pixels from a variety of images within a collection, sometimes that can cause your, um, your algorithm run to, to time out based off of user memory restrictions. Um, so one way to kind of uh, subvert this is to export that composite as say a single image. Um, and then you can, I, I believe you can export that directly as a Google Earth Engine asset, or if you end up downloading it on your computer, you can just re-upload it as an asset and then see if that helps uh, with the algorithm run. Uh, you can also ask for more memory from the Google Earth Engine developers. Um, but uh, John actually helped us with this in the, the example that we used for this session. So John, if you have any additional suggestions, feel free to chime in. Uh, for dealing with memory memory 
errors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, memory um, line errors. No, I, I think you covered it uh, perfectly. So the idea is just to export everything you can uh, prior to running your model. Um, and additionally, if you still get errors while running the model, um, you can try just exporting the exporting the classified image from the model, and then you can view the results that way. That typically will will work. If you get the memory error while you're exporting, um, you know, uh, then you'd have to get kind of clever about it, and you might have to export it for a uh, smaller area or a tiled. Um, it sort of depends on how much data you're putting in and uh, the complexity there. Okay, awesome. Thanks, John. All right. So, question 12 Can we tune the models on Google Earth Engine? So, there are many options within the, the GEE classifiers that you have um, to control and change. Um, things like scale, number of trees for random forest, uh, variables per split, um, and more of those things can be specified within your code. So if you're familiar with running um, certain machine learning algorithms and you would like to update the specifications of those classifiers, then that's definitely something that you'll be able to do in Google Earth Engine. And if you'll notice within uh, the code that we presented today for the random forest classifier, um, there is the, the number 100 in parentheses after we ran that classifier, or, or maybe 300, because I think I believe we ran 300 decision trees. Um, so that was us specifying how many trees the random forest algorithm uh, ran. Okay, question 13. How do we calculate the optimal number of training points required for an optimal classification? So for this, we typically function using the principle that the more training data you can provide, uh, the algorithm, the better. And there's not a single guiding principle for the number of training points that you definitely need to have. Um, and this is what makes accuracy assessment um, especially valuable in this case. So if your overall accuracy ends up lower than say 80% uh, using testing data that the algor algorithm has not seen before, um, you'll likely wanna include more training data um, and also, when you're completing this accuracy assessment, um, having somewhere around at least 100 points for testing in your, in your accuracy assessment is probably a good kind of minimum standard. Um, it's at least the one that we kind of have functioned under recently. So that accuracy assessment can be a really good guiding um, metric for uh, deciding if you need more training data um, within your classification. Okay, question 14. So what happens to those pixels that weren't supplied in the training data? Are they all classified into a separate class or less left unclassified? Um, is there an algorithm that can be used to predict the spectral range beyond the training data? So I think this is two distinct questions. Um, so for the pixels, or well, I guess the reference data that we withheld as testing data, um, those points were just withheld so that we could use them later on in our accuracy assessment. Um, as for the training data, we we left that um, at the 80% range, which trained the classifier to classify all of the pixels. Um, so within a classification like this, no pixels are left unclassified. Um, and I think what you're referring to about the spectral range, if there were a pixel that was beyond the spectral range of the training data, um, that pixel would most likely just end up misclassified rather than not classified at all. Um, and in terms of the spectral range beyond the training data, I believe there are some algorithms that can classify beyond um, spectral range of pixels. But basically what that's just referring to is that if there is, say, a single outlier pixel that has a spectral range different from all of the reference data, um, then there's a really high likelihood that that pixel is gonna be misclassified. But I do believe that there are other algorithms that can compensate for that issue. All right, question 15. In the tree, uh, random forest classification, if it completely uses the training data, um, then how do we test its accuracy? Do we provide another image of nearby data for accuracy assessment? What do we, what if we do not have the reference data? 
Um, so if possible, ground truthing can be a really good way to test the accuracy of a classification. Um, additionally, you can split your training data into two groups uh, for training and validation. And that's, that's kind of what we did in this case. Um, it's up to you to decide how many points you want to include in the testing data. Uh, but typically 10% or 20% of your total amount of reference data is suggested. Um, so in this case, uh, just to reiterate, the, the testing data that we withheld, that 20% of our total reference data points um, was then used in our accuracy assessment class, sorry, accuracy assessment error matrices. Um, and that's something that you would typically want to do if you don't have, say, a separate set of, of testing data for accuracy assessment purposes. Okay, question 16. Can you pull in data APIs or web services, or does all of your data need to come from GEE's available data library or uploaded directly? So uh, our short answer to this is that data just needs to be uh, in Google Earth Engine in some way, shape, or form. So whether that's using uh, the direct Google Earth Engine data catalog or uploading your uh, own data as assets into Google Earth Engine, um, that's kind of uh, the requirement of working with data in Google Earth Engine, um, which is one really nice thing about um, kind of the the breadth of Google Earth Engine's data catalog. Um, typically, if you're if you're using um, really commonly used optical data, say from like NASA or the European Space Agency, you likely won't have to upload your own uh, data assets um, since they're available in the Google Earth Engine catalog. Um, but any data that you do end up wanting to use does need to be loaded into Google Earth Engine. Um, via that data asset upload. Okay, question 17. What do you mean by, for the random forest algorithm, training data must cover the entire spectral range, and how can we ensure that training data covers the entire range uh, during image classification? So when we're, we're referring to uh, spectral range, we're talking about um, the amount of reflectance or the brightness of each pixel at various uh, bands or wavelengths of light. Um, so say you have, I don't know, a maximum value uh, at the green band of uh, 1500 in one of your pixels, but there's another pixel within your classification that has a maximum green value of something like 1750, um, then there's a higher likelihood that that pixel, say, might be misclassified because the training data doesn't include um, band information at that spectral range. So I hope that, that clears that up a little bit. Um, and then in terms of how you can ensure that training data covers the entire range during image classification, um, you could always do a, a quick spectral signature plot of um, your data if you wanted to just look for minimums and maximums of those of those spectral ranges per band. Um, sometimes just looking at the min and max information um, as far as those digital numbers per pixel go uh, can give you enough information about the spectral range to make sure that your training data um, kind of falls within that for all of the pixels within your chosen imagery. And question 18. Is there any option within GEE to evaluate the sample set to have an idea of what samples should be kept and which ones should be discarded to improve the classification results? So I'm not sure specifically of this. I think it would be a similar case in which if you were to plot some of your reference data band information, it would give you um, an idea about how it might classify other pixels. Um, but what I would say for this is that one really good way to uh, diminish the influence of outliers in your reference data is to just have more reference data, which is uh, a reason that I think you'll notice that a lot of people end up having, um, say, uh, thousands to tens of thousands of reference points within their classification if it's a large enough area. Um, so in, in this case, that would be you collecting enough reference data that you can kind of diminish the effect of any outlier. There might be another way to do this, so if anyone has any suggestions, feel free to chime in.
Okay. Let's see. So question 19, how are producer accuracy and user accuracy different? So producer accuracy is a measure of how often real features on the ground are correctly shown on the classified map. Um, or in other words, the probability that a certain land cover of an area is on the ground is classified as such. So that's more of a measure of accuracy of your actual classification. Um, and then user accuracy is the probability that a pixel labeled as a certain land cover class in the map is uh, really this class. So this is more of a measure of the analyst's accuracy in correctly defining training data points. So it's just a, a quick overview of uh, those two definitions of accuracy assessment. Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of today's training, um, but there are functions for producer and user accuracy in Google Earth Engine if you're interested in taking a look at those. In question 20, if I want to do a vegetation classification, uh, but I only have the GPS location of three species, um, which are the ones I want to identify in all the images? Is this method the best for doing that? So if you're interested in identifying three species of vegetation, um, you might run into some issues at the species level there. Um, typically, vegetation doesn't distribute itself um, densely enough for you to say for sure that, say, a 30-meter Landsat pixel is all a single species of plant. I mean, that's kind of one of the difficulties of uh, multi-spectral and uh, moderate resolution, or I guess in this case, in kind of that medium resolution imagery. So you might have some difficulty there defining species, but if you're looking at something that's more similar to uh, types of vegetation like we did here with coniferous and deciduous trees, um, then Landsat um, or something like Sentinel-2 could definitely be sufficient for that. Um, so you could try this classification um, to approximate the types of vegetation that you're seeing. Um, but I would recommend that you have more training points because within your question, it sounds like you have um, only three reference data points potentially. Um, so you'd want to just make sure that you have enough reference data that you're able to train the algorithm to correctly classify imagery. I mean, as I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it definitely helps to have uh, reference data for other land cover types, even if you're only interested in certain uh, vegetation types, um, just because this can help the, the algorithm differentiate better between pixels. So for, for your purposes, you might want to take a little bit closer of a look um, at vegetation type uh, classifications in Landsat and Sentinel-2, and then maybe even see if there's any work being done with, say, hyperspectral imagery, which just has uh, more wavelength information about the light being reflected per pixel, which can be helpful in uh, differentiating between species within a land classification. Okay, question 21. Is there a way to program a k-fold training validation or other types? So let's see. So this is a little bit beyond the scope of this training, um, but we're going to try to take a look at some resources that might help you with this once the session's over. Um, unless anyone else has any information about this. Awesome. So I know we're a little bit over time. We're gonna go ahead and try to get to question 30 and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. So question 22, how do I get the shape file and images in my GEE? Is there a particular projection needed? So Google Earth Engine does this really nice thing where um, it kind of keeps a, a count of all of the projections of anything that you've imported into Google Earth Engine. Um, so you likely won't necessarily need to worry about, um, say, the coordinate projection of the data that you're using. That's something that Google Earth Engine um, tries to take into account for you. Um, but for the purposes of getting a, a shapefile and images into your Google Earth Engine, um, uh, under the Assets tab, you can select the red New button and select what data types you want to upload. Um, and just upload any assets from there. Um, but for the imagery you're using, um, if that's something available in the Google Earth Engine data catalog, you can kind of just call that in directly um, via the code editor or via that search places and data sets bar at the top of the, the screen in the code editor. So question 23, I have a different validation overall accuracy and validation kappa than what Brittany got. Why is this? Should we run it multiple times and take the mean? So it's a really good question. As I noted, um, 
as you run these at, at different times, um, you'll typically get a different answer. And I think that is partially due to um, computing on the cloud. You have some variation in, in the amount of computing that's going on um, and also the analyses that we're using. And um, there's a little bit of variation as you calculate those um, in, in different times. So say running it multiple times and then taking the mean is definitely something that you could do if you wanted to be a little bit more sure about that overall accuracy um, as well as uh, the kappa value. Right, question 24, does the impervious surface layer from USGS NLCD cover all parts of the world? And how do you change the code to classify in a country such as Colombia? Okay, so the USGS NLCD dataset um, covers all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Um, so it's not within the bounds of, of Colombia. We basically just showed you um, this use of the NLCD as a way to use other layers that say have already been classified in Google Earth Engine uh, to your advantage for land classifications. So in our case, we were more interested in classifying vegetation. Um, so we used this NLCD information about urban areas um, to kind of mask out those urban areas or just map them to the default of the NLCD so that we could focus primarily on, on differ differentiation of vegetated areas. Um, so to get to your question about changing a classification like the one that we did in our demonstration um, for a country like Colombia. Um, there's a pretty pretty simple way to do this, which would be um, to just collect some reference uh, training data for uh, urban areas themselves. So that's something that you can do. You can basically just create urban reference data for developed areas. Um, and with that reference data, just use it to, to train your classifier. And then you can basically just um, have the algorithm do the same thing that it did in this case for our uh, forested areas, for cultivated areas, and for our water areas. And so that's kind of a, a principle of any classifier. Any type of land cover that you're interested in classifying, um, you really just need to get some reference data, uh, training points for that type of land cover, um, and then you can use those to, to train the classifier to, to get any land cover types that you might be interested in. Okay, question 25. I have uploaded shape files in my asset for classification, but I am getting errors while adding the property. So can you tell me how to add the property to a feature collection? So you might wanna just email us uh, really quickly for a specific clarification on this, um, but you might wanna take a quick look at the GEE developer page on feature collections. Um, and I provided the link right there. Okay, question 26. Is there any option within GEE to evaluate the sample set uh, to have an idea of what sample should be kept and which one should be discarded? Oh yeah, definitely same question as question 18. So refer back to that once we upload the Q&A doc. Question 27, what would be the best method to include very high resolution imagery, um, for example, UAV data um, into this Landsat based classification process? So I think one thing that you could do with this, um, since you have very high resolution imagery, um, is you could even use that UAV data um, to create training data points. Um, so you could use that UAV imagery um, as a way to uh, define reference data um, at various locations and coordinates um, so that you have better training data for your Landsat-based classification process. So it's basically taking the information that you have from say that UAV data, which is really high resolution, so you can kind of visually distinguish whether something say deciduous trees, coniferous trees, um, even uh, more specific vegetation types than that. Um, and then you can use those as your reference data points to then train a Landsat-based classification, um, which you can kind of blow up the landscape level of. So say you only have UAV data points for, um, I don't know, 50 square kilometers throughout your study area, um, but your whole study area is something like 1,000 to 2,000 square kilometers, um, you could use that UAV data as a way to kind of blow up uh, that information to classify a Landsat image um, to some of the same specifications. The only thing you wanna be mindful of is that there's a difference in spatial resolution there. So if you are using an area that's less than a 30 meter pixel size um, as training data, um, that might end up making your classification of the Landsat data more difficult. Okay, question 28. 
why is there overlap in the variables cloud shadow bit mask and cloud bit mask? So I think I'm gonna go ahead and let Brittany answer this one um, if she's interested. Hi, yeah, sure thing. Um, so that's a really fun question. Uh, so the values three and five uh, for the cloud shadow bit mask and the bit uh, clouds bit mask are referring to the pixel QA value within uh, the Landsat uh, imagery. So pixel QA stands for pixel quality assessment. It's uh, run through this CF mask algorithm uh, for all of Landsat's data. So each pixel is assigned a value based on their contents. So values three and five are pixels that uh, are identified as having cloud or cloud shadow within them. So when we make these variables, cloud shadow bit mask and clouds bit mask, we're kind of isolating the values three and five so that we can mask them out. Um, if you want to learn more about the, uh, the pixel QA values, where those come from and what the CF mask algorithm really does, um, the Landsat 8 product guide is also linked here in the response, but it's a really cool algorithm if you're into stuff like that, so I highly suggest it. Um, I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah. Okay, question 29. How do you handle shadows in high-resolution imagery like NAIP? Is it possible to complete a land cover classification uh, without masking out clouds given that no clouds are used in the training data all right so so to answer your your second question <laughs> first i guess um just because you don't include something as a classification doesn't mean that your classifier won't try to classify it so in this case something like say cloud shadow if you don't provide training data for that to try to classify it out or if you don't mask it out the classifier might accidentally classify those pixels as water or say like a, a darker vegetation type or impervious surface, something like that. Some misclassification um, that would ultimately end up making your, your total classification less accurate. So if you're, you're working with high resolution imagery, really any imagery, um, you would wanna make sure that you're masking out those cloud shadows if possible. Um, and if not, you want to make sure that you have an appropriate number of, of training points so that you can classify cloud shadows or classify cloud pixels um, to make sure that those pixels don't end up being misclassified. Okay, I think for our last question, question 30, um, I'm going to pass that over to Brittany, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, not clear why. Uh, divided by 1, 000, sorry, 10,000 in the mask. Can you explain it? Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer this one as well. I think this is referring to um, the function earlier in the code. And um, in there, it's um, referring to, well, that it happens because uh, Landsat 8 surface reflectance data um, is distributed as a 16-bit integer. They do that just so that it reduces the file size. Um, so as a result of that, uh, you have to kind of unscale these things um, by dividing by 10,000. Um, it's, it's a little more uh, into the computer science than I'm sort of an expert in, but I just know it's, it's a best practice uh, to make sure that you do um, divide by 10,000 when you're working with the data in the function, it's a pretty common thing to have in that function for the masking purposes. Um, you can read more about it, again, just in the product guide for the Landsat 8 collection. Um, but if anyone else has any you know, further insight into the 16-bit integer uh, file size info, that would be great. But that is the, the extent of my knowledge. So I hope that's helpful. Awesome. Thanks, Brittany. Great. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and cap it at those 30 questions, um, but we're going to go through in this Q&A doc and, and answer some more of your questions as well. Um, but if you find that your question didn't make it into the Q&A doc, definitely feel free to email us. Um, you have that, I think, um, on a couple of different slides within the presentation. Um, so definitely feel free to get in touch with us. Um, and thank you all so much for joining. Um, and we're looking forward to presenting session three to you next week.